thanks so much. And here we are for our spring super tennis charter leaders and collaborative leaders uh, webinar. A uh, few things about today's presentation. Uh, just let's start before, during, after. So I'm very pleased and very honored, uh, humbled, challenged, excited to be serving as acting commissioner. And one of the first things that we did uh, when we you know, came into this role, uh, acting uh, chief of staff, Lauren Wu and me, is we reached out uh, to you as leaders and said, uh, you know, we've really appreciated being able to come before you on a regular basis, um, as you know, has happened for the past several years, uh, you know, that, that Commissioner Riley had a, a really strong pattern of doing this. We said, you know, what, what do you want to keep about what we did in the past and what do you want to change for the future? And what we heard was, you know, if you could just make sure that we know a little bit more in advance when the webinars are coming, if we could have more say on the agenda itself and send the agenda ahead of time. And so we really fulfilled all three promises, um, all three challenges that you put before us. Uh, everything that you're going to see on the agenda for today came from you. Uh, these are all things that we we asked uh, the leadership of these or of each of the organizations represented here to ask you the memberships to let us know what is it that you really want to make sure we focus on in a spring webinar. And so we did make sure that you had that information ahead of time because we know there might be people you want to um, in, invite to come to this with you if you know what the topics are. And that was some of the feedback that we got from you. So then if that's before, now we're now we're in the webinar. And so what's happening during this webinar? I just want to mention that we are in a webinar format, uh, not a meeting format. I realize that's a change. I uh, just want you to know I got Zoom bombed uh, late winter, and I will never let that happen to me again. So I've always felt like, you know, um, for me, the webinar feature just works really well, and it gives us a chance to bring you uh, a few different voices from our DESE team in this presentation today. Also, we recognize that not everybody can be here today. So using the webinar feature, we are recording this session up until we get to the Q&A session. We will stop the recording at the Q&A, and we will also post this presentation so that anybody who couldn't be here today can also access this information. So those are some of the important things about you know, what's led us to this point um, and how we will engage together today. The final thing that I just wanna mention is that if you're not used to it, just use the Q&A feature to post any questions. You can start doing that now. If there's anything that you came here wanting to make sure that we discussed, we'll leave time at the end of today's presentation to go over any questions that you have. My esteemed colleagues who are on uh, serve on my cabinet with me are here in the background, ready to be able to answer your questions. And so uh, don't hesitate. Uh, we're here in service to the work that you do for students. And so, you know, please make sure that we're using this time well, and we look forward to just jumping right in. So speaking of jumping right in, here's what we're here to do together today. Uh, you'll notice that uh, the first thing on the agenda is just an update on DESE's educational vision. Again, these are all topics that we heard from you. We heard one of the kind of resounding um, questions was, can you just give us an update on where you are with your educational vision? Then we took the additional topics that you wanted to discuss with us today and just organized them under our strategic objectives. I hope it just helps to make, help to, to bring our strategic objectives more to life, help them connect between DESE and your work as school and district leaders. Um, so you'll see our three strategic objectives there and the topics listed underneath it, again, came right from you. And then finally, you'll notice also that in addition to our strategic objectives, we have also identified uh, core functions. I'll say a little bit about that in a minute. And so everything we're doing today, we just want to have brought to you in a very kind of organized uh, way that you know fits within the framework of how DESE is going about its business at this time. So let's just jump right in and uh, go straight to our education vision. I'm going to kick off this part of the presentation uh, before I have a couple of my colleagues join in just a little bit. Uh, so just first of all, um, hopefully you are familiar with our vision, but it's just important maybe that we step back and talk about why are we doing this? Why does DESE have a vision and its strategic objectives? And really our idea is that if we have a vision of what we are trying to work together towards here at DESE, and if we are able to demonstrate how the supports that we have, grants, professional development, guidance documents, how they are coherent and aligned to our vision, then it will help you, this middle part, strategically select and leverage our supports and resources so that our students have that, that opportunity for equitable experiences and so that they can thrive in their learning. So that's sort of our background, right? Because a long time ago when I was superintendent, 
you know, I noticed there were some times when you could see DESE offices talking to each other in an aligned way, and sometimes they weren't. So we're really working to make sure that there is kind of strong consistency of messaging from what you should be expecting and knowing about our work here at DESE. Uh, I always said to my teachers at Convocation, precision matters, right? So every opportunity we have in front of students, just getting it right, really matters. And for us, it's then just speaking with a singular, consistent voice about what it is that we're trying to do for our children. So speaking of which, um, this is our vision. And uh, many of you have heard me talk about this and my teammates talk about this a lot of just all students being known and valued, the learning experiences as real world relevant and interactive, and that with individualized support, students can excel at grade level or beyond. That's what we're, we're working towards. And uh, so that if you were to walk into really any classroom in Massachusetts, these are the types of things that we want to see students experiencing in the classroom. But their experiences in the classroom aren't enough, right? What is it? What does that lead to? What's it adding up to? And so we also challenged ourselves to make sure that we're clear about the outcomes that we want to see as the result of a public education here in Massachusetts. And so just want to, you know, hone in on this slide briefly with you, just that, you know, what we're working towards is making sure that students not only just attain that academic knowledge and skills, which is obviously highly relevant, but also understand and value um, themselves and others and engage with the world so that they can are curious, creative, shape their path is one of my favorite parts of this statement, um, feel connected and to be empowered. That's what we're uh, just wanting to kind of boil it down to what's this all in service of. So if those are our outcomes, how are we going to reach them? We've created for ourselves uh, three strategic objectives because our vision will be multi-year, right? And our uh, strategic objectives might change over time. They're not changing right now, but we might change our strategic objectives as we sort of continue on this journey towards our vision. So we have three strategic objectives right now here at DESE. How we are working to cultivate systems to support the whole student, and you can see examples of that work. I'm, I won't read them to you, uh, but you know the, the types of things that will uh, help us support the cultivation of the whole student. Uh, promoting deeper learning, our second strategic objectives. And, you know, uh, by pointing out these, the box, you know, below each of these arrows, it's really like, what messages should you hear? If Desi's saying we're promoting deeper learning and you're interacting with our guidance documents, our professional development, our grant opportunities, what themes should you see that are going to guide us towards deeper learning? And they're listed there below um, as some of the most important things that we're working on um, as we continue to uh, instill deeper learning all across the state. And then very importantly, who's in front of our children? And, you know, as we really acknowledge the hard work of our teachers, we want to make sure that we're building out and sustaining the most diverse and effective workforce possible for the children who we serve. So with that in mind, those are our three strategic objectives. And again, and I've kind of organized today's material in relation to each of those strategic objectives. We also said to ourselves, there's just core work, though, that DESE has to do. Um, so we aren't a consulting firm. We are the state education agency. And so things like uh, promoting and measuring quality and compliance, you know, we do a lot of monitoring. Um, we are, you know, we have our statewide assess assessment system. Um, we, you know, have to work on really everything that's on this slide. So there's some kind of truly essential must do's for our department. And what we've said to ourselves is we need to make sure that all of these core functions they also have to align to our vision. We can't just have those three strategic objectives be it. It needs to be that if we really mean this, if we really want to drive towards that change, everything at DESE has to speak towards that. And so today you're going to hear about some of our work in relation to the three strategic objectives, but then you're also going to hear about how we are also aligning some of our, uh, all of our core functions, um, but some of the most recent work towards alignment towards our core functions um, as it relates to uh, particularly the area around uh, promoting and measuring quality um, within our schools. And so uh, look forward to just sharing that with you and hopefully bringing to life this idea of this really matters. Like we're really taking this seriously and uh, working hard at it. And speaking of which, I think it's just important to say, well, what? how are you going to be able to get inside this more? How will you see DESE rowing together as we have this image here on the slide to show you, right? Um, if, if we are working towards this coherence and alignment, how should you in, as school and district leaders 
be able to access this, right? If my theory of action that I started at the beginning was, if we do this alignment, we can then present to you the um, options that you have, the opportunities that you have from DESI to kind of click into that to that vision as it relates to where you you are in your own journey with your schools and districts, um, that uh, we need to present that to you in one, um, you know, concise, um, you know, relevant, timely document. So this June, we will be um, sharing out our second version of this catalog of aligned supports that we first published last year. So I just want you to know that it's coming. What is this catalog of aligned supports? Uh, here at the department, we asked all of our teams to engage in consistent project planning all this spring. Um, and we've worked very diligently to give feedback to our colleagues. So colleague to colleague feedback about whether or not your initiative is aligning to our vision and aligning to our strategic objectives. And I really appreciate my colleagues here, Desi, taking that feedback to heart and making sure that, again, what we are sharing with you is very coherent in its messaging, aligned in its intent, and all in one place, and as best we can, all at one time. Because I know, again, when I was superintendent, often I would get you know updates about initiatives from DESE kind of all throughout the school year. And so we've really pushed ourselves to say, we want to have one-stop shopping for you. That you could pick this up in June and see, you know, if you're working on expanding the diversity and effectiveness of your educator workforce, that you could see what are the DESI initiatives that also relate to that. So that, you know, there's, you would know what to draw on that we have available. And I hope we would give you sort of the comfort and confidence that what you are getting from us with any of our initiatives all speaks to a kind of a consistent whole. So this is coming in June. Uh, we hope it's of use to you that um, that it's again kind of one stop, um, you know, overview of what we have available with links, so that you can go get that information and hopefully apply it in your local context. Uh, what's important about this is that um, it's also contingent upon the state budget, for example. So some of our grant funding opportunities. Uh, will be known as best as we know them at the time, right? They'll be printed as best as we know them at the time when we produce this in June. And we'll have to do an update to it later in the summer once the state budget is finalized. So know that, you know, again, we're working towards one-stop shopping, but also understanding that within the system in which we work, more information will be coming to light a little later this summer. And so we'll have a first version and then a second version. We did the same thing last year. And we'll want your feedback on this, right? So we're, we're working really hard at this uh, to make sure that we continue to bring consistent and aligned messaging to you. And, um, you know, we'll want to know your experiences with this. And so last year, we put out a survey when we released the catalog to get feedback. It really factored into the improvements we've made for this year. And we'll just want to know the same thing this year, because, again, this all has to add up. Um, there are 450 of us or so here at DESE. We're in service to the work you are doing. And so we just want to make sure it, it, it it's very evident and that it shows up in this document and uh, hopefully it just carries us forward into the next school year. So I hope that's helpful as a bit of a background on what is Ducky's educational vision and then how will you see it made manifest? Like how will this become real uh, for school and district leaders? And it's really um, the catalog line supports is just the, the kind of the clearinghouse. It's where you can see all of it. And it's really a lived experience here among our DESE colleagues, and I'm very grateful for their willingness to lean into this process with me. So with that, uh, just as a quick background, uh, let's now talk about how this is a busy slide, but I hope that it uh, just helps to show you how we're making the connection between our strategic objectives on the left and the topics that we are covering today on the right. So for example, where we're working on um, you know, supporting the whole child with our first strategic objective, you asked to hear more about chronic absenteeism and our comprehensive health and physical education standards. So we're just making that connection um, that all of this rolls up together towards a greater whole, towards a greater good. And um, that's how we're making the connection between our strategic objectives and our core functions and the uh, discussion that we'll have together today. So without any further ado, let's get into that discussion and start with our first topic whole student supports and where we're at with chronic absenteeism. And there's good news here. And I'm very appreciative for all the work that you have done to produce this, this great news that we just shared out um, last week at our board meeting and produced uh, for you and all members of the public the week before. 
So uh, as you know, we produce data now since the pandemic on student attendance and um, absenteeism twice during the school year. So we use the March 1st data and the end of year data. And so we just uh, produced the March 1st data once you know the, the data were um, kind of finalized and ready to go. And uh, just wanna make sure that you're aware of that. If you haven't looked yet, uh, this is a screenshot of the statewide report. But if you go to your district's uh, profile on our, uh, our profile page, you can uh, look at student attendance. I just double checked it myself today just to make sure that, uh, that I can find it easily. It's not hard to find. That March 1st data um, really gives you an indication of, you know, how are you, how are things going during the school year and not waiting until the summer to find out. And again, without any further ado, it's good news. Um, and it's very promising about the decrease in the percentage of students who are identified as chronically, chronically absent. So last year, if we take March 1st of 2023 to March 1st of 2024, we see that decline from 24.5% to 19.6, right? So, and that that's fantastic, right? There's more work to be done, right? We're not satisfied with that number, but it shows us that what you are doing is paying off. And we're very grateful for everything that you are doing to invest in engagement with families, engagement with students, to really keep them safely in our schools for learning. And what we can see is that that 20, you know, what that amounts to is a, you know, a 20% reduction. Um, and, you know, really pleased about that. And, um, you know, I hope these other data points on this slide may be useful for you if you are doing presentations on your own work around chronic ab absenteeism. I always think that if Desi can give you some talking points then you can look at your own data and see how you compare to the state to be able to discuss these same data points as well. But like I said, the, the journey's not over. And so if we look back before the pandemic, um, pre-pandemic, we were at about 13%. So keeping in mind, you know, being in about 20% chronic absentee, 20% chronic absenteeism now, uh, we're still, you know, seeing that there's more to do, right? We want to keep at this. We want to keep bringing that number down. Um, and I just want to acknowledge the work that you've done to make that happen and that how all of us working together, as this image shows, all of us part of it, and that, you know, as the school is closest to the family and the student, we know that's where the kind of locus of change can occur in terms of engagement with families, in terms of culturally and linguistically sustaining practices, and in terms of, you know, interactive, real-world, relevant learning experiences that really engage students and, and um, really uh, get them into their learning even further and, and keep them there, right? Get them hooked. And actually that relates to some resources that just came out from the uh, the White House. Uh, they just uh, held their Everyday Counts Summit. And we just thought that, you know, you've done a lot of great work towards, um, you know, student engagement and um, bringing down that, that rate of chronic absenteeism. And maybe you're looking for more ideas, right? If we say the journey's not done and we have more to do, uh, we thought it would be helpful maybe to share with you just um, you know information about the summit that just occurred and then the additional resources and toolkits that are available uh, from uh, from the White House. And particularly when I was looking at these resources and, and toolkits, it was helpful when I got to um, information about other districts across the country because you know we we understand our own context um, here in Massachusetts, but sometimes when we look beyond our borders, we find ideas that we didn't otherwise have. And so I know when I was looking through these resources uh, that we have linked here, um, it was just helpful to see, you know, what's going on in New Mexico or other parts of the country where they've had great success around these same themes, right? About engaging families, engaging students, and uh, but maybe just other ways of doing it that we haven't thought of yet here in Massachusetts. So just encourage you, if you're curious, take a look at these additional resources. They might be helpful as we all stay committed to this work of effectively engaging students in our schools. So that's, you know, briefly on our first topic related to our first strategic objective. I'm now pleased to introduce you to my colleague, Dr. Aaron Hashimoto Martel, uh, Associate Commissioner for the Center for Instructional Supports. And Aaron is going to uh, come on screen and take you inside uh, more information about, um, again, information you requested for us to bring to you today about comprehensive health and physical education standards. And so, uh, Aaron, hold on one second. Uh, let me just go to you and make sure that you can come on screen. There we go. Yes. All right. Aaron, All right. 
Thank you. All right, so I'm excited to share with you all today a few uh, things coming out of the Center for Instructional Support. So yes, the first thing being the Comprehensive Health and Physical Education Curriculum Framework. So health and PE programming are really critical components to a well-rounded education and supporting that whole student uh, picture. So the framework was adopted by the board in 2023. Uh, updating them from the 1999 framework to be LGBTQ plus inclusive, medically accurate, and developmentally and age appropriate. So what the framework does is it provides a pathway for schools to implement educational programming and strategies that enhance students' me mental, emotional, and physical health, while also recognizing the critical role of school climate and culture on student outcomes that we want to see. So what I want to share with you today is a little bit about the support that we've provided and that we're excited to continue providing. So we go to the next slide, Russell. In the rollout of this new framework, we've already held several virtual information sessions to discuss the key elements and also hear from districts about the types of supports that you all are interested in us developing. So the slides and a video recording of that are posted on our website. Um, along with a, the, a handful of other uh, resources that people have found helpful, such as an FAQ and documents like that. We also just completed a tour of five regional PD sessions on unpacking the standards, reviewing curriculum selection or adaptation, and just sharing best practices in comprehensive health and PE topic areas. We're excited there will be a panel session at the upcoming MASS Summer Executive Institute, so we'll see many of you there. Um, and we're also excited to launch a uh, comprehensive health and PE district leader network this fall. So really to provide ongoing support and networking for district leaders who are responsible for the implementation of the framework on an ongoing base basis. Uh, we do plan to schedule more overview sessions and additional PD opportunities, and you'll see them posted in the DESE catalog of aligned supports uh, that Russell talked about earlier, and also will be posted on our webpage. So those will be coming. All right, and then uh, something from a uh, highlight around strategic objective two, which is focusing on supporting deeper learning. We're excited about the coming Mass Literacy for Families and Communities resource. So many of you are likely familiar with the Mass Literacy Guide. So this is DESE's Guidance for Early Literacy. Uh, and the Mass Literacy Guide can be accessed uh, using a link that I believe will be shared in the chat. Uh, and then a couple of years ago, we began a revision process of the Mass Literacy Guide to strengthen it from a culturally responsive lens. That included a decision to add a section of the Mass Literacy Guide designed specifically for families and caregivers, which you see in that bottom corner. Uh, and we hope that this will help give caregivers um, a chance to engage more deeply in their children's education and build partnerships with their schools and teachers, all with that shared goal of supporting students to learn and grow and improve their literacy. But to talk a little bit about uh, the Mass Literacy for Families and Communities uh, resource itself. Uh, we gathered a lot of input and feedback from stakeholders, uh, experts, uh, community members, uh, superintendents, uh, and educators to inform what this resource will be, uh, and we're excited for it to be published soon. Uh, these are the guiding principles that really inform the development of this new resource, making sure it is family friendly, concise and accessible, that it affirms and acknowledges culturally and linguistically sustained practices, that it empowers families with evidence-based information, um, and really that it's supportive of all families. So when it does go live, you'll see the announcement about it in the Commissioner's Weekly Update. And we encourage you to access this page once it's published, to share it with educators in your schools um, and in support of sharing with your families. So we're excited for that to come. All right, and around strategic objective three, uh, which is supporting a diverse and effective workforce, um, I'm excited to share about two things today. So one is the Regional Assistance Centers for Emergency Licensed Educators, which you can access right now. 
So currently we have about 4,000 teachers employed on an emergency license. Uh, many of them are in shortage roles or in high needs classrooms. Uh, and there are no more renewals or extensions to the emergency license. So we have set up these regional license assistance centers across the state. Um, and their, their goal is to provide assistance to educators with the services shown on the right. Um, and they will be available through August, 2025. Um, they stand to support not just emergency license holders, but also teachers working on waivers, uh, including special education teachers, teachers in charter schools. And the assistance centers will connect with individual schools and districts with high proportions of emergency license holders in their region. So that may include site visits and other technical assistance. They also will do outreach and check in with individual candidates to support customized and differentiated supports, whether it's around accessing the MTEL, MTEL registration, alternative arrangements, MTEL preparation, um, as well as customized uh, licensure support around the licensure process. So as of today, all working emergency license holders have received an email from Jesse about the regional centers. If superintendents have not heard from their regional center, they should soon, um, but you're also welcome to reach out directly to the regional center. The, contact, uh, the contacts are listed on the website uh, in the link provided in the chat. And also if you can, as district leaders, really play a role in promoting these resources with the teachers in your schools and districts and encourage them to take advantage of the resources and then providing them the time and support to do so that would be great. Those are available to you now. Uh, the other uh, thing I want to talk to you about today is something we're really excited about, which is the launching of a registered teacher apprenticeship program in Massachusetts. So this summer, the department plans to launch the first registered teacher apprenticeship role in Massachusetts. So we'll join over 35 states across the country uh, that are investing in this new pathway to teaching that is explicitly designed to really promote a more diverse and effective workforce. So registered teacher apprenticeships are aspiring teachers who get employed by a district in a full-time instructional role. So such as a paraprofessional or other non-licensed instructional position while pursuing uh, their initial teacher license with the support of an approved educator preparation provider. So the goal is to really provide a pathway uh, into teaching around that earn and learn uh, process uh, and being ground, grounded in a hands-on job embedded preparation that's rooted in local communities and really is sustainable from both a recruitment and retention perspective. We're excited for that to launch this summer. So what to uh, be on the lookout for is uh, we'll do a lot of uh, information sessions uh, and resources that we'll post over the summer. And then with this fall, we'll release a $2.5 million competitive grant program for districts and their partner ed prep providers who are interested in launching the first cohort of registered teacher apprenticeship programs. So we hope to identify three to four pilot districts by early 2025. They'll receive training and professional development for mentor teachers and leaders. Also that they're prepared to enroll the first cohort of teacher apprentices by fall of 2025. So you can definitely expect to get more information about this exciting new pathway into teaching and how to apply for consideration in cohort one and also uh, information around long-term funding opportunities. So we're really excited about that happening and I'll pass it back to you. Thanks so much, Erin. Um, really appreciate this opportunity to bring to you some of the topics that you had asked us to present on today. Appreciate the questions that I see coming in in the Q&A. At the end, we'll make sure there's time to go back over those questions. But in the meantime, I'm now very pleased to ask my colleague Rob Curtin to come on screen. Uh, just make sure that that can happen. Uh, okay, perfect. All right, Rob, uh, really excited for you to take us inside a couple of topics here today. Uh, and the first of which uh, being our standards and indicators. Oops. Great. Thanks, Russell. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, so uh, I'm here to talk to you today about the revision process that we are uh, uh, undergone related to the district standards and indicators. Um, so Russell, you can go to the, the next one. Um, so 
what are the uh, district standards and indicators? You can see a snippet of here on the on the right hand side of this slide. It is DESE's definition of strong district systems policy and practice, um, and it basically details the department's definition of a well-organized district um, that identifies systems, policies, and practices that if they're implemented well, will lead to improved outcomes um, for all of our district schools, educators, and students. Uh, these district standards and indicators serve as the framework for our district review process, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a moment. Uh, they were the district standards and indicators were last updated in 2018. Um, we like to be able to um, revise them uh, on a pretty regular basis, but um, obviously the pandemic and other things have uh, slowed that process down. So we uh, went we started uh, to begin that process um, within the last year. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the organization of the document in a minute, but it's really important to note that the six standards, which are the highest part of the um, of the document, the six big areas of um, uh, organization here within the document, those are remaining unchanged. Um, but we'll talk a little bit more about the hierarchy um, of the document in a second. So the current version, okay? And what you see here are the six standards. Again, these are remaining unchanged and the 21 indicators that are in the current version. So these standards and indicators were originally developed based on research and input from, um, from uh, school district, state level experts and members of the national educational community. The current form that we have right now it consists of six standards, and you'll see those in blue, and those are not changing. So leadership and governance, curriculum instruction, assessment, human resources and professional development, student support, and financial and asset management. These standards are in state regulation, and again, we're not changing those. Within each of these standards, there are three to four indicators. Right now, there are 21, and these indicators describe the district systems and the functions that are closely associated with district and school improvement and positive student outcomes. Okay, Russell? So let's talk a little bit how the document is organized. So we have, there are three levels, and if you could think about it a little bit as a hierarchy, okay? So as I showed you, there are six standards. These are the high level categories of district functions. Beneath each of those standards, as you dig a little bit deeper, are indicators that are supporting components of each of the standards. And then further, as you dig uh, more deeply, you'll see that there are look-fors. These are specific practices related to each of the indicators that fall under each of the six standards. Our work to revise this document was centered at the indicator and the look-for levels. Again, the standards are in state regulation, and we are not um, changing any of those. So an example of this organization in, in practice is if we look at the curriculum instruction standard. So the standard again is at the top of this hierarchy where you see curriculum instruction. Underneath there are three indicators, the curriculum selection and use, classroom instruction, and student access to coursework. Those are the three indicators that currently exist under the curriculum instruction um, standard. And then under those three indicators, you'll see the look fors that exists. So for example, under curriculum, curriculum selection and use, we look at the decision-making processes that go into selecting a curriculum within the district. We looked at whether we look for whether or not the curriculum is documented and available, and whether or not the and 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 then through the classroom observations, we look at um, how the curriculum is being taught um, in um, to our students. And then you'll see the additional look fors that are under classroom instruction and student access to coursework. So each of the standards is set up this way, and we went about looking at the uh, indicator and the look for level. <clears throat> How do we use the district standards and indicators? We make them widely available on our website, and they can be used by all districts to look inward and to for districts to be able to look at their practices and, and how they're set up um, within their own districts. But specifically at the department, we use the district standards and indicators as part of our uh, district review process that is run out of our Office of District Reviews and Monitoring. We review about 20 districts each year. 
These reviews are statutorily required. Okay. And what we do is we go into um, a district um, over a week or so and look at the system structures and practices that are in place and the, and the ways in which those affect student experiences and outcomes. As part of this process, we do a document collection. We review that document collection. We do um, a lot of focus groups and interviews with district leadership, school committee members, um, city or town leaders, teachers, families, students, basically everybody that is connected to how the district runs um, as part of its operations. We also do classroom observations. We, we observe classrooms in all schools within a school district. And then we issue a final report um, to the district um, that gets published on our website. And at times the district has asked us to present that report um, to its school community. Um, we're happy to do that um, if, if, if asked, but beyond that, generally we provide the report to the school districts and then publish the, the report on our website. So as I mentioned, um, we have gone about looking to update the uh, the indicator and the look for levels of the hierarchy that I spoke about before. We are not updating the standards. We used our racial equity decision-making tool to go to guide our work here. We are updating the indicators and look fors within each of the standards for with three main goals. One is to reflect the most recent and highest quality research around the best practices of, of district organization and classroom practices. Two was to take an explicit equity lens um, in looking at the indicators and look fors that are in the document. And three was to make sure that we had alignment with DESE's educational and vision, um, and hopefully that the district standards and indicators document can inform work throughout the department, um, just to make sure that we have complete alignment in all of the work that we were doing, um, as Russell was speaking about earlier. So we actually started this back last summer, um, again, using the racial equity decision-making tool as our base. Uh, we started the project back in the summer in which we defined the initiative. And that was to make sure that we were um, um, being most, as I mentioned on the last slide, up to date, have an equity lens and searching for alignment. We've been engaging stakeholders since last fall and we have we are now at the culmination of that. Um, and we'll soon be entering the implementation phase uh, in which we put the new standards and indicators to use and reviewing their use to make sure that they are effective. So what did we do as part of this process to, um, to update the district, and standards, district standards and indicators document? The first thing we did was we looked for similar practices in other states. And to be honest, we didn't find a heck of a lot here. There aren't a lot of other states that have a lot that have a similar practice than we do. Again, this is statutorily required. Um, but we, when we went to look for other states, not many had an office that was analogous to the one that we have. We did analysis of all reports that were issued in 2022 and 2023. Um, we particularly, as part of this analysis, were looking to effort, looking for references to equity. We found inconsistency in those references to equity, particularly racial equity. Um, we held feedback calls with superintendents that had recently gone through reviews to hear about what they liked about the process, what they thought could be improved in the process. So we wanted to make sure that we were specifically speaking to those uh, superintendents that had gone through this process to see what they felt about it um, and uh, to get their to get their feedback on what we could what was good and what we could do better. Through the fall of this past year, we had each of the standards um, had a specific, had a committee of DESE staff. We had over 30 content area experts across all of our offices to look at all of the indicators and look fors that we were using um, to decide where we needed to either update, make changes, additions, subtractions, or what have you. And that culminated in us developing a first draft of the updated uh, district standards and indicators that applied the feedback from internal DESE staff. At that point, we gathered feedback from um, uh, different groups, including our board advisory councils. Uh, we went to a few different ones of those. We talked to external experts. We also went out for public comment. 
And the result of that was we received comments from several, uh, from uh, actually from a lot of individuals, from several organizations, um, including those represented today on this call. Um, so um, what are some of the key changes that we're making? And Russell, I know if you just wanna, you can go there. So you'll see here um, on the, on the left-hand side, what we have is some of the, what we found in our previous versions of this document. And the first thing was, uh, it was pretty apparent that we have, there was real inconsistency in the way we were evaluating equity across all the indicators and look for's. The second was um, in each of the standards, um, there was inconsistency in the level of detail in which we were going into. Some of the standards went into great detail while others um, had less, and we wanted uh, to try to address that. Third, um, oh, sorry, that my fault. Um, so the um, you'll see that in the revised draft, what you'll see is um, well, sorry, let me just keep going here on the previous version. So the third thing that we found was not all the indicators and look for's were connected to students and their impact on students. We also found outdated language that did not align with our ed educational vision. And then in thinking about things that we were going to add, we found that there were missing pieces. Um, we did not have a lot in here about systems to support the mental health of students. Um, we were missing some stuff on some of the district op uh, operational uh, district operational side of things. And on the right hand side, you can see what we've done to address some of these areas. The revised draft that um, went out for public comment emphasized all students, um, including and especially those who have been historically underserved. We increased the level of detail throughout the document in order to get uh, clarity and consistency. All of the indicators and look for is now intentionally center students. The new document inclined, uh, includes updated language that aligns with the, vi the educational vision, the coherence guidebook and um, other DESE guidance. And we added new indicators and look for us to, to address some of the missing pieces that I spoke of earlier. Sorry. There we go. Yeah, sorry. Um, so where are we right now on this? Um, so um, as some of you may know, we went to uh, the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education last week. Um, we are taking feedback from that from our board members and other feedback that we uh, received during the public comment um, to create a final draft that we hope to release in the next month. Um, we will use these updated district standards and indicators in the district reviews that will be taking place in the 24-25 school year. Um, that will, once we release them publicly, that will mean that we will disseminate them to support our work across DESE, as well as in district and schools. And then really importantly, uh, we want to make a point to assess the effectiveness of the new district and standards and indicators document by making sure that we monitor the implementation and speaking, dist speaking to districts um, that get reviewed next year um, and making sure that we're looking at the final reports that we issue next year and comparing them to the final reports from previous years uh, to make sure that we have hit the mark in where we wanted to make these updates. So. That's where we are um, with the District and Standards and Indicators document. Um, we're excited and thankful um, to those that commented um, and look forward to the release of the next month or so. Uh, next, uh, I, I just wanted to give a very brief update um, for everybody um, on another one of our core functions, which is the District and School Accountability System. Um, we are currently undergoing um, a uh, thinking about a revision of that district and school accountability system. And I just want to give everybody a little bit of an update on where we are with that. Um, and the big thing here is, and I, uh, we've talked a little bit about this uh, in the past when I've been with you, um, we have formed an accountability system review advisory committee. This is an external group. Um, all of the members are from outside of DESE. There is DESE support, but all of the members are for outside of DESE. And this group has been tasked with reviewing the, the, the existing district and school accountability system. Um, we've asked this group to provide insights on the strengths and the weaknesses of the current system. And this group will, this group's work will culminate in a report that will include recommendations for change for the commissioner's consideration. 
in front of you here, I won't read all these to you, but these were all the groups that were invited to participate in the accountability system review process. Um, and that work has been ongoing, but you can see here, we tried to cast as wide a net as we could. Um, and all of these groups uh, were invited to participate in the process. And where we are um, in terms of the timeline. So um, that group started meeting in December um, and their work is almost complete. They have held so far six of seven scheduled meetings. The seventh will be coming in June. Um, they have been uh, mostly full day uh, meetings. Um, and that group has been working to develop recommendations that will be put in a report um, to be uh, given to DESE. Uh, that report is going to come to us this summer. And um, we will then take those recommendations and do a, um, a more public, um, or, or, or I should say a more extensive stakeholder engagement process, and then think about what changes we should make to the system. And if necessary, bring those changes to the board and to the US Department of Education for their consideration. And then um, I will say the goal right now is to have a September 2025 implementation of those changes. But I must say, I haven't seen the report yet. I haven't seen the recommendations from this group. So that is a little dependent upon the magnitude of changes. Um, and depending on that magnitude, it may um, require some more time from implementation. So I just want to give everybody an update uh, as to where we were in terms of this revision process um, and happy to turn it back over to Russell. Thanks, Rob. <clears throat> Appreciate those updates. And as you can see, I'm struggling with the uh, controls here. I don't know why. It's not like Zoom is new to me. There we go. Uh, let's go to a few things to look ahead to. Um, and we're going to stop the recording.